Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. It's great to be here. Been in Ireland for about three days. Reminds me of home. Sunshine. Seven degree weather. Good people. This is great. I love it here. The, the thing, I'm from San Diego, California, Southern California. The thing here is that it's much more beautiful. It's a green, lush. I love it here. Maybe I'm moving. <laughs> they let me stay. Without it. Anyway, uh, today I want to talk about a, 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 we call it an in-place pipe restoration or in-situ pipe uh, lining, trenchless technology, uh, maybe no dig. It falls in all these categories. And so it, it probably doesn't sound that new to you, but it's relatively new technology. I, I know you get bombarded with a lot of, of um, new technologies. It, it, it's sort of like when I was growing up, uh, I grew up on a farm. We grew a lot of cabbage. And uh, we had these huge cabbage fields. We go out and we cut them and we had to harvest them. And put them in big piles in a row. And then we had a tractor and we had to pull a big flatbed trailer with the tractor. And uh, we would, you know, take the cabbage, load it on the trailer and haul it into the barn. Store it until the prices went up. Anyway, uh, one time I was sitting on the trailer. If you picture this as a tractor and the trailer here, and there's a tire here, you know. And uh, I had rubber boots on. I was kicking my feet, trying to knock the mud off. And my boot hit the rubber tire. And it grabbed the boot and pulled me under. My brother was driving the tractor, and of course, uh, as he's going along, he didn't know, and because he's facing that way, he pulled me under. I don't know if you've ever been run over before, <laughs> but it's a horrifying experience. I mean, I'm laying there and I'm watching this tire, you know, starting to come over me, and all I could do is scream. So I screamed as loud as I could, hoping my brother would stop, and he didn't. And then he looked back, and he thought he was still on top of me. So he threw that track from reverse back up and ran over me again. <laughs> I mean, this is sort of like the technology you get. I mean, you get hit time and time again. So I, I hope that uh, today, uh, as we introduce something to you, it, it will be of interest and it will be helpful to you. Uh, ugly, isn't it? Let's see if I remember. Okay. Well, the beginning, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You know that inherent, when they make metal pipes, they're going to corrode. Inherent in the whole process is a guarantee. If you're, and most of you are much smarter than I am in physics of it. It's going to deteriorate. It, even the speaker before us, as you, with uh, the demand for uh, safe drinking water, they're putting in a lot more chemicals in the water in, in the U.S. and raising those rates. Uh, amounts of chemicals in the water to ensure safe drinking water. It's called the Safe Drinking Water Act. And, uh, but metal itself is uh, in, in, in the, uh, I'm just going through it real quick, is they refine it, you have a high energy level, absorbs energy, electrons, uh, I mean this is, you already know, okay? So guaranteed that when you put pipes in the ground, they're going to guarantee, they're not going to last forever in most cases, okay? So I'm going to go through this real quick. Okay, uh, we have a, uh, this technology as other trenchless technologies is, is really cost effective over traditional replacement of pipe. Uh, what we did with this technology, we did a lot of research in it. Uh, I mean, you know, this, this I'll go through quick. You don't have to memorize this because you've all done it, okay? Now, the process that I'm going to introduce to you started in the uh, 70s, actually 60s in Japan. I ran across it in the uh, early 80s. I don't know if you've ever been in Tokyo, but they have high-rise uh, buildings, concrete buildings. They live in little tiny, they call rabbit hutches. <laughs> they still live in. The thing is, when they built the buildings, they put, uh, they, they embedded the pipes in the buildings, concrete. And so as they start corroding and rusting, they know what to do. And this is how this technology responds, so that they can solve that problem by cleaning and coating these pipes in place. Uh, in the 80s, I, I brought it back. I had uh, connections, not connections, that, that's taken wrong. I had friends 
They were retired Navy captains, and they were telling me the extensive problems that they had on the aircraft carriers. And so I mentioned this technology I'd run into, and I said, well, that's great. So anyway, I went to Naval Research Lab in D.C., and uh, with their funding, we were able to uh, look at developing not only the technology, improving what the Japanese had done, but also getting a suitable coating that, would, uh, that we could use in coating pipes with an application system that we had. So uh, after that, we started coating aircraft carriers and buildings. Uh, we got uh, the NSF-61 certification. It became much more mandatory. More cities adopted it in the United States. That was done in the early 90s. Uh, and 90s to the present, we've been uh, applying the epoxy with this particular technology. Everything from high rises, commercial buildings, hospitals, factory schools, municipalities, homes, uh, you name it, we've, uh, we've done it. Okay, the application here, just real quick, these are some of the projects that have uh, been used on. Some of these buildings do have uh, very large pipe in them, six, eight inch pipes, we do, especially the HVAC systems and, water, and the fire systems, as well as some of the water systems. Delivery system. Historic properties where you don't want to break walls out. Uh, sometimes rain leaders, everything are embedded in the walls or sometimes in the, in, the, in the columns that run in a cathedral. So rather than try to tear those out, we could do repair those in place. Hospitals, uh, industrial applications, factories, <coughs> municipalities, uh, pipes. Uh, and I'll talk about lead service lines uh, a little bit later, which may be an interesting shopping centers, uh, government, military applications, uh, a lot of that. Okay, what I wanted to talk about, spend more time on, was the, what time do I have till? Okay, until 105. 12, what? 105. Well, that much? <laughs> I think I'll go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll be lucky, you'll be out of here and eat lunch here real quick. Uh, <laughs> Okay, this is a pipeline process. We identify a segment of pipe, a drain pipe, uh, water pipe, whatever it might be. We identify so we can work with a particular segment depending upon the diameter. Okay? If it's a half inch, we do from half inch up to 12 inch. So if it's a half inch, we can say do uh, 100 feet. What's that? 30 meters, roughly, at a time. Maybe a little bit more. And uh, with two inch, it's more up to eight, ten inch. We can do a, a thousand uh, feet at a time, roughly 300 meters at a time. So that uh, the size and diameter, the, the system itself will dictate how we have to uh, uh, break the uh, work up into segments. After that, we clean the interior of the pipe with the sanding agent, and uh, these are usually NSF 61 approved. They're, uh, what we use is garnet which is very hard, a little less hard than diamond. It's very sharp, and uh, injecting that into the airstream to clean the pipe, it lasts quite a while, and it doesn't break up and cause dust. So that's why we use it. <clears throat> and then uh, after sanding, uh, also uh, the purpose of the sanding is not only to clean the pipe, but to establish a proper profile, anchor tooth, so that when the coating goes on, now we have two technologies. I'm, I'm focusing more on this uh, coating technology initially uh, because I think you're familiar with some of the other structural lining in place uh, lining processes. Some of them are already mentioned. But anyway, we establish a profile, profile on the surface of the pipe so we have a good, strong mechanical bond. Once we establish that and put the coating on, we've tested up to 10,000 psi to make sure it'll stay on. Uh, then we test the system, once we've cleaned it, we test the system for leaks, and we can tell that by pressurizing it, watch and see if there's a drop. Uh, if, there, if there are leaks, then we'll identify where they are, and we may have to make spot repairs as we go along. Okay? Usually with the structural liner that we have, or with a new pipe, uh, new pipe replacement in that particular segment. Because in most systems, the whole pipe is not Bad. There are spots where you have holes, either defective uh, construction, maybe uh, hot soil, we call it, no acid, acidity of the soil made in there, maybe a rock there where they laid it, rubbed through the pipe. 
uh, a number of other factors. If the whole pipe is bad, well, then we're too late. <laughs> and then uh, after we test for leaks, uh, seal those up, uh, we'll coat the interior of the pipe with the epoxy. And then reassemble and flush the system. And disinfect it. <laughs> okay, this is sort of a before and after. Actually, that's not a bad pipe there. Uh, easy to clean. Okay, this is sort of how it goes. This is the staging of the equipment here. The primary force that we use is air. We do not use mechanical devices. Therefore, we can navigate changes in elevation, like this, or we can go around curves, bends, 90s, whatever it is. Okay, so we're not restricted as to configuration of the pipe. So uh, we stage, uh, uh, we, we have a, uh, trying to figure out how to use this, yeah. We have here a air compressor is our primary source of energy. The air, after the air compressor, it goes to an after cooler, we cool the air down, pull out all the water, the oils, we have all these filters on. And then we reheat the air, because what we like is to have hot, dry air to push into the system. And again, depending on the diamond, the pipe will determine the uh, pressure that we're putting the air through, anywhere from 60. If you get a large diameter pipe, you're down to about 20, 30 psi going through there. Our main objective is to get that air moving through there about 200 feet per second at least. We know that the physics of what we're doing will work if we're at that particular uh, rate of uh, air. And then at the end, uh, right here, we have a cyclone, the big pieces drop out, and then a dust particle. So basically it's sort of a closed system. Uh, no dust, debris get into the air. So it's very safe in its application. Uh, we isolate a work segment. Now these are all right, uh, apartments or risers or whatever. So if this were an apartment, all the hot water system, we, we, we would uh, isolate those. And we can do one segment at a time. If we're doing water main, we could do, say, uh, 100 meters and all the lateral, you know, the service lines coming in, we'd hook up air. So everywhere water goes, comes in, and goes into the building, we reverse the system. Air comes in, or water comes up, used to come out, and go back into the larger pipe for collection. Okay. So we can have multiple inputs, but we have one exhaust. The uh, cleaning process is we start at the closest to the exhaust. The reason for that is obvious is that we start at the top, we may plug up the whole system because some pipes are really bad, especially galvanized pipe in buildings or service lines. So we'll, we'll try to get a start at the closest to the exhaust, work our way up, clean, and clean our way down. And uh, how do we know the pipe's clean? <coughs> Good question. Well, if it's big enough, we put cameras in. If it's not, obviously a half-inch pipe, we can't, we can't put cameras in there. But what we did with Naval Research Labs, we took four-foot sections of pipe, and then we put unions on them, we'd you know, go this way, down, up, etc. <coughs> we clean the pipe, we disassemble every piece, examine it, make sure it's clean. Put it back together, and then we coat it. Same thing, after it's coated, we had to disassemble, put it, put it back together, make sure every piece of pipe is coated. Now the reason that it works is the air goes through at that speed, it picks the abrasive up and just the turbulence of the air just scours the inside of that pipe. And it will clean that tuberculation right off down to a white metal. Even if there are, uh, I don't know if you call them pits or indentations, you know, where there's corrosion is more severe in certain areas than others, it will clean those out. There may be s small areas which it obviously can't do, okay, to be honest with you there. There are ways of even getting that out with chemicals if, if that becomes a necessity. But basically, you reduce, not reduce, you, you, you clean the pipe down to bare metal, white metal, with this process. Uh, then we start the lining process. The lining process, uh, different from cleaning, instead of starting at the end, we start up here at the top. Coat segment by segment. 
on down. That way we know we coat the whole system. We calculate the diameter of the pipe and the lengths we have so we know how much epoxy we need to put in in each of the inputs, whether it be here, 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 or here. And then we'll put a little extra so we get it at the end. Okay, how do you know that it's coated? <coughs> The physics of it is, is that you, you have a, a pipe here, the air going through at say 200 feet per second. On the surface of the pipe, there's resistance. And so it slow, the air speed will slow down there, and the air pressure will push the epoxy right as you inject it into the system, pushes it right against the wall of the pipe in a very uniform manner. Because the pressure is, is pretty consistent around the the, uh, the pipe. It will roll the epoxy, pull and push it down the pipe at a very, very slow rate. It's, it's basically moves about like that. And so as it rolls over itself, it coats the whole interior of the pipe. Same thing we did, I explained before, when we cleaned it. We had to take those segments apart after we cut it. We examined every elbow. You know, every piece of pipe, and we'd have usually 100 feet or more of pipe to make sure it coated. On large pipe where we've been able to uh, put cameras in, we can do a camera inspection afterwards to ensure it. So if we know that there's coating up here and there's coating down here, we know that everything's coated in between. How do you, so, how do you account for the T? The T? T. Okay, as the epoxy comes in here, this stream is coming here, we cut down the airspeed here somewhat, and, and, and over here, and this air is controlled so it will come out here. We have a manifold system which we can manipulate the air pressure so we can guide the epoxy to where we want it to go. So the technician is everything <laughs> in this process. Do they screw it up? They have, yes. But basically, uh, we don't have too many where the T's are straight across and like that. Usually they're off center a little bit. And, and uh, they'll uh, be able to coat the pipe without a problem. The other part, the question you may have is, what about an elbow here? Usually, if you go like this, the air will bring it like this, and there's a little blind spot on the other side where the air you know, sort of passes over. What we do at the end is we slow the air speed down so it will just bend right around, push the epoxy right around the bends. It's only a, you know, a piece that, uh, that much. So, so we can get the whole pipe coated. So as we give a 10 year guarantee. But anyway, uh, that's how the coating process goes. The coating goes on, if it's a vertical run, pretty consistent about 10 to 12 mils. Thousands of them. Uh, if it's a horizontal pipe, it'll be a little thicker on the bottom than on the top. And the reason for that, a lot of times, most of the problems are on the bottom of the pipe, rather than on the top. So there, there can be variation, just a little bit from top to bottom. There, there are anti-sag agents in there that keep it from all just falling off. Once we mix the epoxy, it's 100% <coughs> solids epoxy, so there are no solvents in it. Once we mix it, we have about an hour and a half to work with it. That's what determines a lot of times how much we can shoot in a particular system. Once we manage that correctly, we have no issues at all with the epoxy. Once we get the epoxy in the pipe, we'll keep the warm air will be put on it to accelerate the curing of the product. We like to usually, uh, there are different epoxies. Some uh, can cure in five hours. Uh, like to have it probably a 12 hour period before you put water back on. Temperature ranges on the bottom end really don't matter that much. I mean, it can be very, very cold. The high end is about 180 degrees F. I'm not sure if that is centigrade. Yeah, I should have looked that up. I apologize. <coughs> uh, what else can I the, the epoxy <coughs> is a, it's a polymer in which you have this cross-linking and it forms these polymer chains. This is why the longer cure period is preferable because like concrete, you take concrete and cure it too fast, it starts cracking. So if you let it sit, in fact, you keep it wet, so it, it'll sit up and you get all the, the, the chemical reaction taking place. Same with the epoxy here. So 
So this, preferably 10, 12 hour curing time, uh, allows long polymer chains to form. This is what gives the strength to the coating, also gives it flexibility. Now the first applications we had were aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers in constant vibration. Okay, so one of the concerns they have is that with that vibration, will that cause the epoxy to delaminate? The answer, of course, was no, it didn't. Because they built and designed, the, we had to, Dr. Brady and Dr. Atkins who designed the, the product, uh, made it so that it would be flexible enough to withstand that kind of, of uh, I guess, harsh uh, mechanical environment. The other part is that uh, the, these epoxies they make now are very strong. They withstand uh, a lot of chemical resistance. Acids, that, that there are epoxies that will, but won't uh, work with this application. But uh, high uh, solutions, say 20, 15% acid, that, that will cause problems. Low, three, four, five percent, that's not a problem for it. Petroleum products, these type of gases, it's not a problem for this uh, particular color. This is some of the equipment, this is, you know, the air compressors that we have, they're fairly large, if we're doing large diameter pipe, it just depends on the application. We just did a product of the U.S. Capitol project, uh, product, uh, in which we're doing 12 inch pipes, so we needed uh, 10 of these, actually a little bit larger than these. This is 1100 CFM, we were using 1600 CFM compressors. So the larger the pipe, the more air that you need in order to achieve the uh, speeds of uh, the air that you need. These are some of the dust collectors. Uh, this is set up with some hoses on high rises. Manifold systems. Some of the benefits, well, we, we find it to be very cost effective over traditional repair. Now, like the lead lining, uh, these type of pipes, we could do a uh, minimum of 10 a day, maybe 20 lines a day. Uh, probably, I, I saw in one of the early presentations, roughly uh, 2,000 euros per line, probably a 50% reduction over that by this type of process. Because lead pipes are really good. <laughs> they just cause a few problems <laughs> along the way. But uh, we've coated them. Uh, we've put them in a continuous water loop that was went on for over a year with uh, no lead leaching uh, out of the pipe. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, off the pipe because of the barrier coating. So, but for homes, uh, for other applications, industrial applications, street applications, especially mains coming in from the street, uh, there's been a huge cost savings, anywhere from uh, 30 here, but uh, sometimes 60, 70 percent on aircraft carriers, it was a factor of 10. <coughs> uh, Non-disruptive because you're not uh, digging holes, uh, you're not breaking down walls, etc., cutting slabs. It's very, uh, it's not very disruptive. We've done elderly housing project, for example, where the people are still living in their units and still able to uh, fix the pipes in there. <coughs> Time factor uh, is much quicker than usually traditional repair. The pipes are sitting rather long here outside and probably not much of a savings. But for anything that's in the infrastructure of a building or street, then it becomes much faster because of lack, uh, there's no requirement for demolition, digging holes, trenching, etc. Uh, abatement is minimized. Uh, this doesn't apply to the streets as much as buildings where they may have asbestos or other types of problems. Uh, you can alleviate that if you don't disturb what's in the walls. Molds, as buildings mostly, are not applicable. Equal friendly technology, everything's clean. NSF, National Sanitation Foundation approvals for uh, potable water. But sometimes it is the only feasible solution. We've run into many situations where, especially historical buildings, where they just can't break things apart. And uh, this way they can apply it and we can solve the problem for long periods of time without having to break everything down. That's it. If you have any questions, I'll rush through it, uh, leaving some time for questions.
Interested certainly from a portable network point of view for drinking water network, which is a um, significant concern for everyone here today. Um, the process itself looks good. One of my questions was similar to that gentleman with regards to the concern as of how potentially it could block customer service pipes because sometimes they're pinball diameter. But I think you answered that question. One of the concerns is what happens after uh, you implement that process and that process is completed with regards to getting a network, where it's a portable network, we're getting the network back into commission and for people to consume water again from that. Do you deal with the coronation process, the commissioning process, or is it contained to the actual installation itself? Ours has mostly been contained to the installation itself. We usually get a third party to come in and do the uh, coronation or whatever the legal process requires. And in the U.S., it's different states, different cities. Cities have different requirements, so they, some of them, they have so much chlorine in the water that once you put it in there, they're pretty comfortable with what we do. Any other questions out there? We're getting hungry for lunch. Yeah, they are. They're <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, thank you. Thank you.